Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Metropolis Radio. Today, we are looking at Survivor's 11th season, Survivor Guatemala. Now, this season has been one of the most forgotten seasons in the show's history, if not the most forgotten season in the show's history, mind you. Now, I know that the winner from this season came back for Survivor Winners at War, and I actually argue that had Winners at, had Winners at War not happened at season 40, then Danny Boatwright never gets brought back to the show. Uh, so what we're going to be looking at is, does this season even deserve to be forgotten? Or does it deserve to be put in the spotlight, but production has done anything and everything to prevent that? And if that's the case, then why? Was it the cast? Was it the twists? Did something really bad happen this season that they don't want anybody remembering? So with all that out of the way, guys, let's get right into Survivor Guatemala. Now, as always, when we look at Survivor seasons, I start off by looking at the twists that the season brought. And we're going to start with the big one, you know, that this was the first season to bring back two returning players to compete against all new players. Now, we wouldn't see this again until seasons 22 and 23. That would be Redemption Island and South Pacific, respectively. Now, the twist changed for season 38, where they brought back four returning players with 14 new players, and that was Edge of Extinction. Now, the twist only worked, in my opinion, because this season filmed a month after Palau had ended. So, at least the cast of the season already knew who Stephanie and Bobby John were before going in and getting blindsided with two players that, that you and I know, the audience knows, but the cast is out there going, who the fuck are they? And in this season, instead of a tribe swap, it was a tribe switch. Uh, now, I don't think that this twist was really handled well, and basically, I'm going to try to get into the nitty-gritty of it. Try, try, try your best to follow along, and I don't mean for this to sound condescending, but seriously, try to follow along with this. Two members from each opposing tribe went on some picnic reward, and then the rest of the people at the reward challenge were asked who has the most tribe spirit. The majority vote and whoever the majority of them vote and whoever receives and whoever receives that majority vote remains on that tribe while everybody else switches. So instead of being on tribe A, you're on tribe B or so, something to that effect. Now, is that really the way to handle a swap? Not really. I think it was just a bad way to handle it. And I'm even I'm trying to explain it here and even on my end, it it the swap seems a lot more complicated than necessary. Why not just have every single person who's who's remaining just draw a buff randomly and then, you know, you go from there. You know, handle it like a normal swap and then the guys on the picnic don't get swapped but remain. That would have been a far more interesting twist. You know, this is just one where, you know, try to introduce a new twist and it backfired horribly. And this is also the first season to have the feast or challenge twist. And this would get brought back periodically but it's not used very often uh basically the idea behind it is that if you feel safe that night that you're not going to be voted out then you can eat a feast instead of participating in the immunity challenge and if you choose to compete in the immunity challenge then you don't get the feast again i only bring it up because this is the first season to really use that and i think it's only been brought back like a handful of times because it typically doesn't work and now I've been saving the big twist for last. Survivor fans know what big twist I'm going to talk about. And that is that this season introduced the, the hidden immunity idol. Now, keep in mind, this was the first season to ever use it. In modern seasons, it's more of a necklace. In this season, it was a six-inch statuette that was hidden in the jungle. And once it was played, it died. Uh, it was not reburied slash rehidden. You know, all that all that fun stuff that's that's now today. And it expired at the final four. Keep in mind, this season went down to a final two. So yeah, once it was played, that was it. Now, the rules for playing the idol were, were different in the season. But keep in mind, this is just the first iteration. The idol had to be played before the votes were cast. In modern seasons, you have to play it before the votes are read. But that wasn't always the case, and we're going to get more, more into that in, 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 uh, in future seasons. I don't want to get a little too ahead here. Um, and again, this was the first season to ever use the Hidden Immunity Idol. There were some kinks that had to get worked out that eventually did, but you know those kinks didn't really work out until season 14. But like I said, I don't want to get a little too far ahead here. I don't want to, pull, I don't want to start to pull the cart before the horse. 
So um, if I ever get around to doing um, Exile Island and the Cook Islands, you know, we'll talk about how the Hidden Immunity Idol was handled there. Now let's move on to the cast assessment portion of this, and we're going to start off with the Nakum tribe. I think that was the tribe in yellow. Yes, that was the tribe in yellow. Uh, we're going to start off with Jim. Now, Jim was the first boot of the season. Uh, he was the oldest player of the season. Now, to be fair, his vote off was not strategic at all. Uh, he admitted at Tribal Council that he had tore his bicep during the, immu during the first immunity challenge. And again, to be fair, tearing your bicep is going to take quite a while to heal, especially if you're in your early to mid-60s. And next up, we have Brooke, and I don't really remember too much about her. She's rather inconsequential to the entire season. And I even brought this up in Palau that you're always going to get those one or two that are just there, but you don't really remember them. And that and that's fine. You know, not everybody has to be memorable. Uh, then we've got Blake, and he was the guy that took the tree to the shoulder during that first reward challenge, that 11-mile hike. Uh, took him down for a few days. Now, to be fair... Not all toxins are deadly, but they can do some damage to you. They can do some damage to you no matter who you are. Uh, and him being in pain for the first few days after a spike branch essentially fell on him and actually penetrated him, yeah, I could I could believe that, that he would go down and be largely affected. Uh, then we have Margaret, and I remember that she was the nurse on this season. Um, I think had she not been a Debbie Downer by the end of the pre-merge, she gets a lot further just simply because she's a nurse practitioner. You know, her skills in a jungle can be very, very valuable to everybody out there. And I was shocked that she didn't capitalize on that early on to basically secure her position in the game. But, you know, now we're starting to go down the rabbit hole of a uh, of, uh, woulda, coulda, shoulda. Uh, the next up, we've got Brandon. And I remember him that he was the farmer on the season. And the real reason I don't remember him as much is because you had Bobby, John, and Jamie as the stronger characters this season that fit that role that he was meant to fill. Had Bobby John not returned this season, then he probably would have stood out more. But just unfortunately, this is just a case where he gets overshadowed by the returnee. And speaking of Bobby John, then we've got Bobby John, you know, one of the returnees this season, one of the last two members of the Oolong tribe in uh, Survivor Palau. Um, in this season, I think we see a more realistic Bobby John in the sense of how he would have played had he been on a winning tribe. You see him as a more of an in-your-face kind of guy, but again, that's it. but again, for those of you that don't know, that's just being competitive. And there's a fine line between being competitive and being a douchebag about it. I don't think he was being a douchebag about it, but um, definitely you saw him as a lot more competitive this season than you did in you know, Palau because, well, you know, he didn't win a damn thing in Palau. Uh, then we got Judd, and Judd was a character. The doorman working in New York, originally from Jersey. Um, and he was the straight shooter this season. Not entirely like a Rudy Bosch, but just one of those like uh, North e Northeastern guys that just, you know, that just sit there and they talk and they have absolutely no fucking filter. You know, and and honestly, when Margaret was getting voted out, here was the funniest part this season. When she was getting voted out, you could tell the guy was basically like eat, like plastered, pissed, drunk, whatever term you use. You can tell this guy was basically plastered during that entire tribal council. And it was really funny to watch because he's already the Northeastern guy with absolutely no fucking filter that all of a sudden like really has no filter um, and let's be honest, if any of us get drunk enough, you know, we all lose our filter. We've all been there and done that, and I'm pleading the fifth after this. And then, and, and then finally for our cast assessment on Nakum, we have Cindy, who was the zookeeper, and she is mostly remembered because of the car challenge. You know, in this season, she had the opportunity to offload the curse of the car challenge by foregoing the car and giving the cars to the four people left in the game. She chose to keep the car for herself, and she was subsequently voted out that night. Now, that happened at the end of the game, but she still made her mark despite the fact that, that this event didn't occur until the end of the game. And for those of you that don't remember, anybody who won the car challenge back then never won the game. The car challenge was first introduced in Australian Outback. I think Colby won it. He was the runner-up to the game. Then Lex won it in Africa. And Lex was voted out third to last. 
Um, and then Sean won it, and the Marquesas was voted out at Final Five. You know, so on and so forth. I can I can list all these examples, but yes, back then it was known that if you won the car challenge, you did not win the game. Now this would not be the last season to use the car challenge. That would be about two or three seasons later. I I know for a fact China didn't use it, but um, I don't remember if Fiji had used it. So um, yeah, we'll get to that point at some point. I'm tangenting again. Now let's look at the Yasha tribe, and that was the tribe in Teal. Uh, the first two, um, I'm just going to get right out of the way. That was Morgan and Brianna, and I don't remember either of them very much. And for me, Morgan, Brianna, and Brooke just all blended together for me, which, which is fine. Like I said, not everybody has to stand out on a season of Survivor in order for it to be considered a good season. You just need to have enough people there to pick up the slack. Uh, then we have Brian, and he was the strategist this season, and he would have made it very far had he not been screwed by that tribe switch. You know, on the new Yasha tribe, it was four old Naku members versus three Yasha members. So had that switch not happened the way it did, had the swap not happened the way it did, I feel like he gets very far, if not wins the whole game, as a result of the fact that he's basically the Rob Sestronino this season, and many people were comparing him to Rob C at the time, even, you know, even back in like 2005, 2006. Uh, the next up we have Amy and not really a strategist, but what she's mostly remembered for this season is for spraining her ankle during a challenge. That was the mind ball game. Then spraining it again during another challenge and actually winning the second round of that second challenge, despite the fact that she's playing on a sprained ankle. And if there was anybody to bring back just on the grounds of being memorable for Braun, it would be her. And I would also argue even for Brian with just the fact that he he was the guy got, that got screwed by the swap. But um, let's go ahead and move on before I start tangenting again. Uh, next up, we have Jamie. Now, he was the opposite of Bobby John. You know, he was the rival in terms of wrestling. You know, when the merge happened and you knew that when the merge happened, this was going to be big. The problem with that was Bobby John was voted out too early. And what set Jamie Pack in what was the fact that his main alliance just couldn't stand his paranoia. If the main alliance post-merge is still going to have the numbers advantage despite getting rid of you, then they're going to do it if they cannot stand you. But yeah, that like dream, you know, wrestling match, you know, Bobby John versus Jamie, Bobby John versus Jamie never happened because it was first Bobby John and then Jamie got voted out immediately after. Then we have Gary, Gary Hogaboom. Uh, for those that don't know before Survivor, Gary Hogaboom was the quarterback for the Cowboys back in the 80s. Um, yes. Uh, now, in terms of Survivor lore, he was the first person to ever find a hidden immunity idol. And not only that, he was the first person to ever play the hidden immunity idol. And that's what caused Bobby John to be voted out that early. Had Gary not found that hidden immunity idol and played it, we would have potentially seen the big rivalry between Bobby John and Jamie unfold like a WWE match. You know, let's be honest. But, you know, this is one where the twist was absolutely necessary at the time. The game needed to get changed up, but it did kind of backfire in that regard. Uh, the next up, we've got Lydia and not really a challenge beast or even much of a strategist. I actually compare her more to, to someone like Sandra from the Pearl Islands. In the sense that she was getting by and only acted when she needed to act. Could she have won the game? Probably had she gotten to Final 2 just because she was so liked. Now, was there a chance that if she went to Final 3 that she would win the challenge to secure that position? Um, to be honest, she would probably have a better chance of winning the National Lottery five times in a row. Because usually those Final 3 challenges back then were all endurance-based. And usually it was always the people that were the more that were the more athletic always did better in them. And then finally, we've got Rafe and he was the other strategic mastermind in this game. Uh, and he played a very similar play style to Stephanie. And we'll get into that just a little bit later, you know, because when we get up to Stephanie, um, he would actually end up winning the most amount of individual immunities this season with four. And most people are lucky just to get one or two for the season. Some of gone as high as three. It's rare that you ever get four. Uh, now, in a game that became about getting rid of the physical threats to win challenges, 
He wasn't axed until final three, and that's only because Danny felt like she had a better chance at beating Stephanie at the final two over Rafe. And just a fun fact for, for you guys, if you guys don't know, Rafe from Survivor Guatemala is currently the showrunner on the uh, on the show uh, Wheel of Time that's uh, going to uh, Amazon Prime. So, um, yeah, for those of you guys that are more into the pop culture side, not really the reality TV side, you know, that's a nice little, um, that's a nice little uh, crossover, the connection between Survivor and uh Amazon's Wheel of Time. I, I well, I thought it was interesting. I don't know about you, but eh, I don't care. I'm gonna say it anyway. Now let's get into the gameplay portion of the season, and we always start with the pre-merge. And right from the beginning, you knew that this season was just going to be a gnarly fucking season. It opens with a reward challenge that's like an eleven, an eleven to an eleven and a half mile hike through the jungle, followed by rowing up the lake, and the winner gets the better of the two camps. Basically, the loser gets the short end of the stick. But here's the funny part with that. The tribe that won the challenge was actually worse off for the immunity challenge, given that all the men on the winning tribe essentially were going down from exhaustion and dehydration. So was it really worth it to win the better of the two camps? You know, was was it a reward or was that really just a punishment? You know, that's how this season sold itself on just how gnarly it would be. And Yasha was making the exact same mistake that Oolong was making during the pre-merge in Palau. And that was vote out the people who aren't athletic enough by comparison to the top two or three people who happen to be insanely athletic on the tribe. And what this leads to is the inevitable question of was, of, was this why Oolong was doomed? Not just, you know, and I think I said this in my Palau uh, retrospective review that um that you had oolong that that was basically just a lot of, a lot of indians without a chief but if they're voting off people that aren't athletic enough at some point you're going to run out of people to vote out you know and yeah like i said if someone like stephanie only cares about athletic ability even though survivor fans know that you need a lot more than just people who can throw a ball or swing a stick to win a challenge either, either reward or immunity then the tribe is doomed you know, you need you need the people with brains just as much as you need people who are insanely athletic. It's a symbiotic relationship. The brains can't survive without the athletes, and the athletes can't survive without the brains. That's typically how the old school seasons worked. But some people valued the athletic side over the brain side, and that's and you know that could be rather costly. And why did Nakum keep winning? It was simply because of the decisions that Yasha was making. There were more puzzle challenges this go around over like the brawny type of challenges that Palau had. And like I said, you need people with brains to figure out the puzzle. You know, I'm not saying that just because you play football or you're insanely athletic, you can't figure out a puzzle. But let's be honest here. Most of those people are meatheads. You know, you need those one or two puzzle freaks to really to really help you out. And quite frankly, Yasha just kept getting rid of them when they probably shouldn't have. Now let's touch on the post-merge aspect of the game. And in the post-merge, this is where we see the new Yasha members get voted out left and right, leaving Danny as the only one left. And it's from this point that the majority of lines started to turn on each other. And was there a reason for this? Yes. Yes, there was. Now, I could sit here and argue that all day long, but I don't want to bore you guys to death. Uh, now, was it effective? You know, that's the ultimate question. Was that move ultimately effective? Not really, because the person in the final two that was in the majority alliance didn't win the game, and uh, we'll get into that just very shortly here. Now let's actually talk about the final two and the person who ultimately won the game. As always, we always start off with the winner, and no secret, I already spoiled it in the beginning, that was Danny. That was Danny Boatwright, the last member of Yasha at one point in the merge. Now, I personally believe that she should have been voted out of Final Four, the fact that Stephanie and Wraith didn't see Danny as a threat to win Final Immunity basically sealed their fate. And let's get to the runner-up this season, and that was Stephanie. You know, the other returnee from, from Palau actually made it all the way to the end, but didn't win. And it's not like she only lost by one vote either. She only received one vote during the final Tribal Council. And I brought up the Majority Alliance turning on each other and how that could have worked. If Stephanie wanted to win the game then she needed to work with Rafe and Lydia to vote out Danny at Final Four, 
Because Lydia was not going to win that final immunity challenge, that final three immunity challenge. No way. She's not athletic enough. You know, ask Lydia at final three, and then she and Rafe would be final two. They both played a similar game in the sense of destroying the majority alliance. And the majority alliance members on the jury can be as bitter as they want. They can be bitter motherfuckers all day long, but they still have to vote for one of those two to win the game. So in real, yeah, but in reality though, Danny was the second option and you don't give the jury the option to vote against you if you turned on them. Whereas Danny really wasn't in the Alliance. She was targeted more. Um, the jury would vote for Danny because she didn't piss any of them off. And I have to ask again, if Stephanie is the great, is Stephanie the greatest player of all time? Not really if she couldn't realize that. And I've said this before, but you need more more than just athletic ability to win the game. And Colby Donaldson proved that as early as the second season back in Australian Outback. All of those times that he won the, the individual immunity necklace didn't mean jack fucking shit by the end. Now let's touch on what I said in the beginning. You know, why is this season forgotten? And in my opinion... This was because production wanted everyone to forget that this season happened. And I can pin it on one thing, and that was the big twist ultimately backfiring. And I'm not talking about the Hidden Immunity Idol. You know, I think that was a throwaway twist at the time. I believe that production wanted either Stephanie or Bobby John to win the game and screw the rest of them. You know, Stephanie gets all the way to the final two and loses pretty badly to Danny. It's an, it's, it's an absolute blowout. You know, and they've done this with other seasons. A more recent example would be Edge of Extinction, where they brought back four people and none of them got within a hair's breadth of winning. And on top of that, the person who won the game only played the game for like nine days. So that is a season that production more than likely wants you to forget ever happened. It makes sense that if the main twist of the season backfires, you'd rather hide the blunder than live with it if you're a member of production. But let me let me also pose this question. Does this season deserve to be forgotten? Because just because production does everything to hide it, you know, sometimes it's better left, you know, in the past. And my answer to that is no. If you're a Survivor fan but haven't seen Guatemala or absolutely just refuse to watch it for whatever reason, then I believe that you are just doing yourself a disservice. This season changed Survivor forever with one little twist in the game known as the Hidden Immunity Idol. Now, some will argue that that twist was a benefit to the show, and I am one of those people, but I do think that the twist kind of went, the twist went too far. Uh, and others will say that it started, that it started the downward trajectory of the show, and both have legitimate claims. If you're a fan of Survivor and you haven't seen the season for whatever reason, all I would have to say is basically just watch it. And guys, that's going to do it for our Survivor Guatemala retrospective review. Now, uh, if you would like to follow me, um, I am I do have a blog that is metropoliscreator.blogspot.com. I do treat that more like social media than anything. If you want to follow me on a social media site, I am over on Twitter. My Twitter handle is at Metropolis. That is with a capital M, lowercase e, T, R, capital O, lowercase B, E, L, I, S, K. Now, if you cannot fucking stand Twitter, which I do not blame you for not standing Twitter, I am also on Parlor with the exact same handle, at Metropolis. And guys, I also do gaming live streams every Friday night around 10 p.m.-ish Eastern Standard Time over on the YouTube channel. Sometimes I start later, sometimes I start early, sometimes I start right on the nose. It just depends on what kind of day I'm having that Friday night. And last but not least, if you enjoy the content that I produce, then please subscribe to both the YouTube and BitChute channels. It's a small click for you, but for a small channel like mine, it really helps out a lot. Also, like, comment, and share this around only if you want to. You are never obligated to do so. The links to the blog, YouTube channel, and social medias, along with the BitChute channel, are all in the description below of whatever platform you're currently watching this on. And that is going to do it for, uh, for, the, for the Survivor Guatemala retrospective review, guys. So I will see you uh, next time.